Good evening, classmates. So tonight I'll be sharing with you the life of Donald Mackenzie McKinnon, which was born on August 27, 1913 to March 2, 1994. Who is Donald McKinnon? Donald M. McKinnon has been one of the most important and influential post-war British theologian and religious philosopher generally elect, uh, eclectic, frequently elusive, usually, intellig uh, usually intellectual generous, uh, persistently richly challenging, and always astonishingly erudite. He had a significant impact on the development and subsequent theological work of younger generation, largely emerging from Cambridge. Donald McKinnon's life. Um, he was born on August 27, 1913 in Oban, Scotland, and the only child of a pro uh, procurator fiscal of Argyll, and he was also married to Louise Dreyer. His education, um, he studied in Archfield School, Edinburgh, in, from 1921 to 1926. He went to college in Win, uh, Winchester College, 1926 to 1931, and New College, Oxford, from 1931 to 1935, where he held scholarship and graduated in both grades and theology. McKinnon's career started as an assistant lecturer in moral philosophy in the University of Edinburgh from 1936 to 1937. Then he became a fellow and tutor at Cabell College, Oxford from 1937 to 1947. He also held the Wild lecture, uh, Lectureship in nat uh, Natural and comparative religion from 1947 to 1940 or 1945 to 1947. He was appointed to the Regis Chair of Moral Philosophy in Aberdeen University from 1947 to 1960. He was also the Honoris Hall's Chair of Divinity in Cambridge from 1960 to 1976. President of the Aristotelian Society and President of the Society of the Study of Theology. He was also elected a Fellow of the British Academy in 1978 and in Royal Society of Edinburgh in 1984. He was awarded honorary degrees by the Universities of Aberdeen, Edinburgh, and Stirling. McKinsey's works uh, were a study in the, uh, ethical the, uh, theory in 1957, uh, Borderlands of Theology, which was published in 1968, uh, Explorations in Theology in 1979, Themes in Theology, and the Threefold um, Chord in 1987. It was during McKinnon's school days in Cardiffield School that he became communicant member of the Anglican Church, which gave him liturgical discipline, which was the context of most of his intellectual work. His membership of the Anglican Communion was held within the Scottish Episcopal Church. McKinnon's renown as a speaker was demonstrated by invitations he accepted to deliver named lecture series in Cambridge, Exeter, Aberystwyth, the London School of Economics, Newcastle, and Stirling. Much in demand as a uh, conference speaker, McKinnon traveled extensively and served inter alia on the Theological Commission charged with drafting papers for the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches in 
Makinan attached great importance in Locke's distinction between primary and secondary qualities, seeing their early insistence upon the attachment of an empiricist epistemology to a realist ontology. For all the attractions of forms of idealism, whether in metaphysics, ethics, or even the philosophy of history. An engagement with the world experienced in empirical form lay very near the core of McKinnon's approach to both philosophical and theological questions. McKinnon's central, uh, central philosophy work of the period 1947 to 1960, a study in ethical theology which was released in 1957. The work had greater emphasis on historical perspectives than tended to be fashionable in the, in the 19th, uh, 1950s although it was certainly a contribution on moral philosophy rather than the history of moral philosophy more narrowly defined. The elusive and now wholly successful final section dealing with the re relation between religion and ethics was the forerunner to much later illumination. In his writings, he paid respect for the utilit utilitarian insistence that human happiness cannot be wholly divorced from empirically describable states of affairs, including social condition. <clears throat> Wakinan's writing is frequently dense, always involves complex reasoning, and is usually arranged in some quite unpredictable and, and complicated pattern. In part, this, this has to do with the scatteredness of his thoughts that appear to struggle to find a coherent expression. But more significantly, the difficulty comes from the searching and disarming, even devastating reflection that exposed problems to view and refuse to take the, road, uh, take the broad road for easy, of easy, easy solutions, premature resolutions, and trivializing abstraction of concreteness that characterizes much academic work as well as public, political, and ecclesi ecclesiastical discourse. Perhaps more important than McKinnon's scattered, untidy presentation and conventional erudition is his intellectual sensibility that reflects on the infinitely rich God whose commerce with the world brings it to the cross of Christ. McKinnon was restless spirit, one whose writings bear the scars of human disaster through his performance of a kind of tragic sensibility that destabilizes all attempts to lock up any human practice or belief in inviolability. Contesting premature triumphalism or evading the modesty that comes with a sense of fragility is the burden of much of his work. McKinnon's real value lies in the form of his restless reasoning through his intellectual fragments, and thus in the way he detects and wrestles with a problem, simply put his uh, refusal to be bought off with quick and simplistic commerce of the neat and easy solution, and his perennial suspicion of others who fail to struggle sufficiently with such difficulties, remain an invaluable theological education. This is the constant interrogative challenge he places on our discor uh, discourses in a near-prophetic manner that functions as a perennial plea for vigilance against intellectual carelessness and material impoverishment of the theological and political imagination. Kant's influence on McKinnon. 
Kant is the great philosophical figure of modernity for Makinan, separating yet holding together the realm of the nature and that of the freedom of the autonomous rational subject, while seeking to posit renewed possibilities for speaking about morality, aesthetics, and religion. One important aspect of Makinan's project was that of bringing what he sought to be the clarifying rigor of the earliest 20th century positivists into conversation with Kant. To this conversation, he added an abiding commitment to a realist orthodox Christian theology. Given the disparity of these interests and the way that they oppose each other fundamentally, it is not surprising that his efforts were deliberately and self-consciously unsystematic. McKinnon preferred to express himself in essays, lectures, and short books, mediums that are generally better at raising questions and probing possibilities than attempting anything by way of definitive solution or knockdown argument. While allowing for creativity to subtly the openness of texture can also be frustratingly obtuse. McKinnon's moral deliberations are a locus where his attraction to agnosticism and a form of realism become particularly evident. In addition, the moral focus lies at the center of his attempts to articulate the, con the content of Christology and metaphysics. Just as McKinnon understood Christology to stand at the center of theology, so he sees at the heart of Christology an act of freedom on the part of Jesus understood primarily in terms of a rather stoic sound moral agency. The claims which Christians make for that which he endured demand that he shall have approached his sufferings in a particular way, not simply as a luckless victim of uncontrollable, uh, uncontrolled circumstance, but as, one, as someone who, even if he found that circumstance uncontrollable, yet freely accepted the facts. This attempt to highlight Jesus' moral agency as a central component of any account of his life is mirrored in the positioning of moral concerns near the center of McKinnon's forays into philosophy. McKinnon on contra-liberalism. While McKinnon saw great promise in Kant's moral turn and the possibility of theological re-articulation via practical reason, he was critical of the sort of emaciated theology he detected in, in this sort of liberalism. He resisted, that, he resisted the naive expulsion of the problem of metaphysics and feared that concrete suffering and tragedy may be muted, uh, muted by liberal notions of moral consensus and progress. McKinnon appears to have remained impeccably critical, which in some ways explains his participation in the Catholic wing of Anglicanism from his student days in Oxford and then consistently to the end of his life. Like British liberal theology, British Anglo-Catholicism was and remains a complex phenomenon and they are not mutually exclusive. Yet, its, uh, its general character was shaped by its beginning as a movement of protest and retrieval. It sported in an inbuilt grain of suspicion toward modernizing um, trends in theology 
even though its more reactionary edge was mod moderate moderated by Lux Mundi and the second generation of reformers. While McKinnon uh, subscribed to this movement, he was also known to child fellow Anglo Catholics with just as much, if not greater, vehemence whenever he perceived this conservatism of fostering a willful ignorance of the serious schemes of modern philosophy and political science. Or on the other hand, betraying this conservative impulse with an uncritical subscription to modernist intellectual fads. In this way, McKinnon was something of a serial outsider, often showing inordinate sympathy to forces that were undeniably hostile to theology, such as logical positivism and Marxism. Whilst remaining some of his hardest criticism of the theology, theologians and church leaders who were in all respects closer to him in terms of polit uh, philosophical and religious commitment. The motivation for McKinnon's uh, antipathy towards certain types of 20th century theological liberalism not only arose from concerns about its adequacy for a sufficiently orthodox and philosophically rigorous account of the faith, but also in the way it, uh, it failed the demands of the historical moment. He saw it, he saw it as an attempted the uh, therapy that, fi uh, that failed in its diagnosis and its attempted cure. McKinnon was not an uncritical devotee of Kant, and this allowed him some flexibility. The onto theology of old needed to yield to the purgation of a realist empiricism. Yet, likewise, McKinnon insisted that the anthropocentrism of rational religion needed to yield to the purgative claim of revelation in history. <clears throat> For McKinnon, a focus on moral philosophy helped to identify some points on which philosophy <clears throat> and theology may become more intelli intelligible to each other. But there was no sense in which such a focus provided a ready solution to theology's marginalization or a rationale that somehow lessened the scandal of revelatory particularity. Much of what has been outlined so far calls for greater clarification and substantiation to emphasize that Christology or to emphasize that Christology was at the heart of McKinnon's theological enterprise and that he went about constructing his approach with characteristic creativity, independence, fragmentary, fragmentariness, open-endedness, and moral intensity. 